Hello and welcome. We are so excited to have over 300 registered attendees from more than 60 countries today for our second Invest Virtual Workshop, Freshwater Quality Models, brought to you by the Natural Capital Project, or NatCap, at Stanford University. We hope all of you and yours are doing as well as possible, given the continued pandemic. We'd like to let you know that a recording of this webinar and the slides we present today will be available on our virtual workshop webpage following the event. I am Jesse, your host. I am a GIS analyst with NatCap, and I'm grateful to be joined by a talented team of natural capital experts. Ginger is our star and lead presenter today. Lori and Fotten will be managing your questions and comments and Stacy will be curating and selecting some of those to answer verbally on air. Also, please feel free to contact us anytime at investsummer2020 at gmail.com. So I'll get to our schedule in a moment, but first please pay attention to this important request. We ask that you only use the question and answer or Q&A box to submit questions to Ginger and Stacy related to NatCap, Ecosystem Services, Invest, or other workshop content. Before submitting your question, browse those that others have submitted, and if someone already asked the same one, simply click on the thumbs up icon to bump it up in priority. Please reserve use of the chat box for logistics or to seek technical assistance related to accessing or participating in the webinar, not for questions to Ginger about content. That's Q&A for workshop content, chat for issues with the webinar itself. Thank you for your cooperation. We are anticipating that we will not be able to answer all questions submitted today due to time constraints. However, we will compile all unanswered questions and follow up via email with answers from our NatCap experts. Following this introduction, Ginger will start with an overview of Invest Sediment Delivery Ratio Model, or SDR. We'll then have a five minute break before getting into some interactive exercises. Ginger will begin the second hour with an overview of the nutrient delivery ratio model or NDR. We'll then have another short break before the NDR exercise session. Stacy will assist Ginger with posing and answering your questions during the overview and exercise sessions. Depending on how it goes, we may not stick to the schedule minute for minute. Ginger could get through the overviews in, and including the Q&A in under 30 minutes in which case the breaks would come a bit earlier than shown here. We will devote any leftover time to the exercises. We will switch to NDR at the top of the hour. I'll keep track of time and let anyone, everyone know of any little adjustments as we go. We're not quite there yet, but please stick around to take the post-event survey. Your feedback is extremely valuable and will help us to improve future workshops by customizing them to your needs. Last time, I failed to share the survey quickly enough, so please be patient today, and I will be sure to launch it on time at the end of today's event. This is the first time we're doing this type of experiential learning virtually, and we will adapt with each workshop. Typically, we conduct hands-on workshops in person with small groups. So today, we will be learning what is and is not possible online. Please do keep this in mind when providing feedback through the survey, so that we can make practical modifications to upcoming virtual workshops. We thank you in advance. Now we have our first poll question presented by Lori. So hopefully everyone sees that on the screen. Did you attend the first virtual intro to Invest webinar? Greetings everyone, this is Lori. I'm gonna give everybody another moment to vote. And then I'm gonna end the voting in five, four, three, two, one. Yes, I'm going to share the results. It looks like 62% of you had attended the first one. So thank you very much. Very cool, thanks, Lori. Thanks for your participation in that poll. If you were not able to attend our first virtual workshop, or if you would like a refresher, please go to our website where you'll be able to view the full recording and access the complete slide deck. That's at naturalcapitalproject.stanford.edu. On that same page, you'll also find the link to register for our next Invest Virtual Workshop 
Urban Invest, Modeling Ecosystem Services in Cities. That will be on August 18th and will be led by Chris and Roy from NatCap's Cities team. But today, NatCap's very own GIS programmer analyst extraordinaire, Ginger, is here to teach us about Invest freshwater models, starting with SDR. So please take it away, Ginger. All right, thank you, Jesse. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, thank you for coming back. Thank you for joining us. That's really exciting that so many of you were here for the first workshop. Um, I, I'm glad that it was interesting enough that you came back for volume two. So um, yeah, as Jesse just said, the virtual format is new for us at NACAP, of course, as many of us are navigating new ways of doing things during the pandemic. So we're still figuring out how to reach as many people as possible and still give you a hands-on interactive experience because we know that that is the probably the best way to learn these tools. So we're really looking forward to hearing your feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Uh, and I'm very happy to have Stacy Wolney with us. So Stacy will be monitoring the Q&A box. Hi, Stacy. Uh, Stacy is a senior GIS analyst with NatCap and she has developed a lot of these training materials. So she is really the expert. Um, with these materials, and she will be helping me out with answering questions. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Stacey. Okay, so um, we're going to start with a little overview of um, the sediment delivery ratio model from INVEST and talk about how this model works, um, the kinds of places where it's useful, and then later in the hour we will get a little bit of hands-on um, practice with looking at the model inputs and outputs. And I hope most of you have the um, course workshop data packet downloaded to your computer so that you can go through the inputs and outputs with me. If you don't have it, it's okay. You just have to watch me demo on the screen. So it'll be a little less interactive, but don't worry if you don't have the data packet, um, it, you'll still be able to watch the demonstration. So first, let's talk about um, what this model is and, and what it can be used for. So the sediment delivery ratio, or SDR, model deals with sediment loads in the stream. We talked about this a little bit in the first workshop. The model is all about how natural capital or natural ecosystems impacts the load of sediment in the stream. So some of the decision contexts where the SDR model has been useful for us are uh, in the context of payments for watershed services programs, like the case study that we talked about in the first workshop, the Upper Tana Water Fund used a model very similar to this. The model is useful um, when looking at the impact of development or infrastructure on sediment loads and streams. It can be used at the national scale to account for national scale services of vegetation keeping sediment out of streams. It can be used for uh, to evaluate global land use change, like the impacts of agricultural expansion on sediment in streams. So some of the services that this model can be used to address are um, health and well-being of downstream beneficiaries in terms of lowering sediment in the streams can be used in an economic setting. Um, if you think of avoided costs of water treatment due to lower sediment in the stream, or perhaps higher provision of hydropower due to lower, lower sediment in the stream. And of course, the service of stream health, direct biological integrity sediment is detrimental to most organisms that live in the stream. So in the supply service value framework that we use at NatCap, this model, SDR, helps to capture the biophysical supply of sediment retention performed by natural landscapes. And then when that water from which sediment has been retained is used by people, 
that leads to the service of water purification. And then there are various ways of putting a value on that water purification service. In the first workshop, we talked about the case study where a detailed economic analysis put a dollar value, a monetary value, on the uh, value of avoided sediment in the stream. Overall, this model helps us to understand spatial patterns of sediment sources on the landscape and transport into the stream to assess the service provided by the landscape in keeping the sediment out of the stream. So the model runs in two main steps. First, we compute potential erosion loss from each pixel based on the universal soil loss equation or USLE. The second part of the model is to compute the delivery of sediment from each pixel to the stream. So this is where we get to export, sediment export or sediment delivery to the stream. Let's talk through each of these steps a little bit. Uh, we uh, talked about this a little bit in the first workshop. So USLE um, tells us how much sediment is expected to erode from a parcel or a pixel. And it's the product of these five factors. Each of these factors is considered per pixel. Slope, erosivity, which relates to rainfall and kind of describes the erosive power of rainfall taking sediment off of a pixel. Soil erodibility, which is related to how easily the soil can be eroded. And then two vegetation related factors, the conservation factor or the P factor, and the crop factor, the C factor. These describe the ability of vegetation to keep sediment from being eroded from that pixel. So USLE is predicted annual erosion in tons from this pixel. Um, and it's the product of those five equations, those, those five factors. This gives us how much sediment we expect to come off of the pixel. So USLE is a very well-established and old and popular method, which is great because it means when you are looking for data to parameterize the SDR model, it's relatively easy to find studies that have used the SLE, USLE equation um, it all over the world. So that's a, um, a plus on this side. However, some of the drawbacks or the limitations of the USLE concept for modeling erosion. Importantly, it only models overland erosion. So it only considers um, erosion, kind of sheet rill erosion coming off of slopes. It does not consider gullies, channels, or landslides. So it would not capture those sources of erosion. Also, it only considers on-slope deposition. Uh, it does not consider floodplain in-stream deposition. It does not consider reservoir sedimentation or filling up um, deposition on the bottom of the stream. Also, there's known high uncertainty in a few of the key parameters, such as the slope factor on high slopes where landslides might be more common. The C and P factors are notoriously difficult to um, supply precisely. However, um, in the spirit of INVEST, it's a simple and relatively easy to apply method. And that is, the, that is the goal with all of our models. So after we um, use the USLE equation to predict how much soil is eroded from that parcel, the second part of the model is to calculate how much of that sediment actually makes it to the stream or is exported or delivered to the stream. This is a fraction or a ratio and it describes the fraction of soil coming off of a given pixel that is exported to the stream. So this is the sediment delivery ratio, the ratio of sediment that is delivered to the stream. Um, and from this, we get an idea of sediment loads in the stream and the places on the landscape that are not just experiencing erosion, but that are really contributing to sediment in the stream. 
So as an il illustration of how the delivery ratio is calculated, we'll look at this orange pixel. After we've calculated USLE on that pixel, um, we look at two topographical spatial factors related to that pixel. First is the upslope area. So this is the area on the landscape that drains into that pixel. And you can think of this as contributing energy to carry erosion from that pixel into the stream. So if that area is large, if it has high slope, or if it doesn't have much vegetation to slow the energy of, of water, then it will carry a lot of the soil eroded from that pixel to the stream. The second part is the downslope path. This is the path that water follows after it leaves the pixel of interest, the orange pixel, between that pixel and the stream. So if this downslope path is very short, or if it has a high slope, or if it doesn't have much vegetation to retain the eroded sediment, then it will deliver um, sediment to the stream. So from these two topographical factors, we calculate the sediment delivery ratio for each pixel. And then the sediment that is delivered from that pixel is just the product of the delivery ratio and USLE, or the sediment coming off. Total export over the whole watershed is just the sum across pixels. So a really important thing to keep in mind with this model is that once the model represents sediment reaching the stream, it is considered exported. So once um, sediment reaches the stream, it is kind of finished. So we don't include any represent representation of in-stream deposition. And this means, we'll talk a little later about the implications of this, but one of those implications is that where the model thinks the streams are is really important to how much export you get. So after that biophysical process of export has been modeled, it is possible to use those outputs from the model for valuation. Um, for example, using an avoided cost approach, such as avoided costs of dredging or avoided costs of water treatment. Um, however, this comes with a big caveat, two big caveats. Before performing valuation on the outputs of this model, it's very important that the model must be calibrated, meaning that you have some empirical data to compare to the model outputs and tweak some of the model calibration parameters until you know that the absolute values of the model outputs are in the right range. It's also uh, important that the economic analysis or the valuation analysis that you apply to the outputs of this model be appropriate to the context where you're doing that evaluation, that valuation. This is why most invest models do not contain a valuation part embedded in the model because it's very difficult to come up with a generalizable valuation approach. Usually that valuation uh, really needs to be driven by the context in which you're applying it. So the inputs to the model are uh, the components of USLE or those, those um, landscape descriptors and topography so that the upslope contributing area and the downslope retention path can be calculated. So we need uh, rainfall erosivity, which can be derived from annual climate. We need soil erodibility, which can be gotten from global soils databases. We need a land use land cover raster associated with that crop factor and P factor. Those come in a biophysical table. And we need a digital elevation model. Um, a watershed is also required input. So this would be the boundary of the area where you're using the model. It's important that this model be run for a hydrologically complete area or a complete watershed because we need to be able to calculate the upslope contributing area for each pixel that we want to calculate the sediment delivery ratio for. So it's common to um, make the mistake of running this model 
on a political boundary, such as a country or a state, um, just remember you must run it for a hydrologically complete area. If you do have data available, empirical data available for model calibration, there are a few uh, easily accessible calibration parameters. But usually for a first run, we recommend that you use default values for those calibration parameters. Another important input that I want to mention is a threshold flow accumulation. This is related to the topography and it helps the model to create streams by routing flow across the landscape. The threshold flow accumulation um, is the number of pixels that must flow into a given pixel for that pixel to be considered a stream. So if you think of a flow accumulation raster where we you know, route um, flow across the landscape, this, if you use a threshold of 10,000 pixels, that means this pixel that is a stream is drained um, by drains 10,000 pixels. So the reason this is important is because remember, once sediment reaches the stream in the model, it's considered exported. So with a large threshold flow accumulation value, um, you'll have a very coarse stream network and sediment must travel a long way over the landscape before it reaches a stream. Compare that to a stream network generated with a very small threshold flow accumulation. In this case, your stream network is very fine and there is, uh, it's a shorter distance from each pixel to its nearest stream. So this means the landscape has less chance to retain sediment. So this is an abstract, it's a totally non-physical uh, number. It's related to the resolution of your digital elevation model because it's expressed in the number of pixels. And it's also related to um, the aridity or um, the actual uh, look of your stream network. So the right way to come up with this value is to try a few different values for threshold flow accumulation and check the streams that are generated by the model which is an output of the model against a real perennial stream network. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into actually looking at uh, model inputs. So a very common question is, you know, wow, the model requires all of these data, very precise, where can I find them? Uh, maybe you're getting started on a new study um, and you wanna know where you can find those data for your study area. So the first place to look is the model documentation. You can reach this on our website. You can also reach it through the model user interface itself. Each invest model has an extensive user's guide that has a section with guidance on finding sources for data for a new area. For example, here is the user's guide for the SDR model showing um, some good global sources for a digital elevation model. Also, you remember that the NatCap forums are a great resource to go and look for suggestions on where to find data inputs. So this is what the model user interface looks like. You can see that uh, most of the inputs here are simply file paths to the location of the input on your computer. This is just a picture, so I can't click around, but I wanted to highlight a couple things. First, there's this link up in the right-hand corner to the model documentation. So if you click on that, it will take you to your local copy of the documentation for the model. The one right next to it says report an issue. If you click on that, it will take you to the user forums. Um, so that is a great place to, to go if you have questions or just to look for um, guidance from other people who have used this model. Um, there's a little browse button right next to each input that will is just a handy link to browse to the input on your computer. And then there's also this handy um, blue help icon to the right of each input. If you click that from the model user interface, that will give you a little bit of information about what that input 
is supposed to be, such as maybe it'll tell you it needs to contain a watershed ID field, or um, it will give you some helpful hint about each input. So the main outputs from the model are um, maps at the resolution of the digital elevation model that contain potential soil loss. So this is calculated from USLE, and this is, you know, given erosivity, erodibility, slope, and vegetation, what is the expected annual soil loss from each pixel. The model also gives you a map of export. So how much of the sediment exported, or how much of the sediment eroded from each pixel is exported to the stream? And a map of sediment retention. I'm getting close, Jesse. Um, the retention index is calculated by the model um, relative to bare ground. So this is a sort of a relative index. It gives you an idea of where vegetation on your landscape is really holding back um, sediment. And all of those results are also aggregated up to the vector extent uh, given by your subwatersheds if you supplied that as an input. Some of the important limitations of this model first. All outputs of this model are annual average values. Remember, it considers only sheet wash rill overland erosion. It requires calibration to empirical data to have confidence in the absolute value of outputs. If you can't calibrate the model, the relative differences across space will be uh, well captured. And a reminder that valuation is highly contextual. I just want to highlight a couple of other um, places to find information. The user's guide is the first place to go. We also have some helpful resources on the website, such as a parameter database, a literature database, where you can look for peer-reviewed literature that used this model. And then again, as always, the user forums are a great place to find questions from other people and also to ask your own questions from our staff. So given that, um, let's take a few minutes for questions about this model. Okay. Um, so we do have a few questions. One that was asked a couple of times in different ways has to do with um, the being uh, the area being hydrologically correct. So modeling a watershed as opposed to a municipality. Um, so somebody would like a little more um, of an explanation of that, what it means to be hydrologically correct. And then um, somebody else asked about, you know, running, creating a buffer around a watershed to include the municipalities that are around there. Um, so okay. two questions in that vein. Okay, I'll take a stab and then um, you can weigh in too, Stacy. maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, so a hydrologically complete or correct area is just an area that captures the top of a watershed. So we need to be able to calculate the upslope contributing area for each pixel that you care about. So if you cut your area, you know, into a, a rectangle or a political boundary, then you're leaving out some of the area that, that drains into that. So there's a couple of great tools made by NatCap that are helper tools that are distributed along with Invest. One of them is Delineate It, and we use this frequently. It simply draws watersheds. So it will use the digital elevation model that you would supply to, to, uh, to the SDR model to delineate hydrologically complete watersheds. And that's what I would suggest doing. If you have a municipality that you want to use this model on, you can use the delineated tool to get the watershed that contains that municipality. Um, and that would be a better, a better strategy than using a buffer because the buffer is not related to hydrology or how water flows across the landscape. 
Yeah, I, I don't think I have much to add about that. Um, I, the thing I will remind people is that, you know, if you do cut things off at municipal boundaries, sometimes you're only doing a, a national cert, a study, for example, then you just have to be very clear to people that we were looking at this within the country, but the fact is this watershed covers three other countries. So um, making that clear to people, I think is really important if that does happen, but we just recommend that it doesn't happen. Um, another question has uh, to do with um, places where we might not recommend using this model. So places where it doesn't work so well, or maybe cases where we wouldn't recommend it at all. Um, I would, I'm thinking of um, very mountainous places, places with really, really high slope where you know that landslides might actually be the main driver of uh, sedimentation into rivers. So that's the, um, that's the application that comes to my mind in terms of something where this model would really not be appropriate because it wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to predict the location of landslides and it wouldn't be able to predict how much landslides are contributing to erosion. Do you have anything else, anything else in mind, Stacey? Uh, well, some of them I, I think were talked about in the limitations of the model, like not only places with landslides, but places where somebody else asked about a case where um, what if you know that the overland erosion is not the dominant type of erosion? And in that case, I just wouldn't use this model because if you know that most of your problems are coming from within streams or, you know, gullies or landslides, then this is just not an appropriate model because otherwise you'll only be informing a small portion of the result. So there's that. Um, steep slopes, definitely you'll get some funky numbers on those and um, you'll want to just pay attention to that. And then the last one I'd say is a reminder that this model, all the outputs of the model are on an annual time scale. So if your erosion mainly happens in during big storm events or very seasonally, then this model isn't going to capture those. Okay, so let's see what else did we ask for. Um, Uh, oh, can we can we combine inputs using different resolutions? So if we have a DEM that's 10 meters and we have a land cover that's 30 meters, can we do that and what happens? Great question. So um, yeah, all of these equations like USLE, um, you'll notice are kind of run on a raster stack. So the model basically looks at the value in each pixel from of like erosivity, erodibility, all of those inputs. And so internally for the model, it's important that all of those inputs align. They have to, you know, be, um, have the same raster grid structure in order to apply those calculations across the raster stack. So the model performs that resampling internally. The model will make sure that all of your inputs align and have the same grid structure. The authoritative resolution for this model is the DEM. So um, if you do use inputs with different resolution, which is fine, that works. Um, the model will take care of it and will resample everything to align to your DEM. I think when I run this model, I often like to do that resampling myself or at least get close to that resampled value because then you can see what happens. For example, if you resample the land cover to match the DEM, you can see, oh, this pixel that used to be classified as cropland at the old resolution, when you resample it, it becomes something else, maybe. It can be good to actually see that rather than having it all happening behind the scenes. And I'll answer one really quickly. It says, is it possible to see the intermediate stream network without completion of the model run? Um, the answer is, well, if it crashes, it may have made the stream network, but you can also use the tool uh, route them uh, that we provide in order to create the stream network without running the model. Yeah, that's another super helpful uh, helper tool. So you don't have to run the whole model. If you wanna check your stream network, uh, you can just use that route dem tool to generate the stream network and you don't have to go all the way through SDR. Mm -hmm. 
Let's maybe take one more question before our break. Okay, so I, we've had a couple of questions about floodplains, actually. Um, so I, I have a feeling that people are not going to be that happy with our answer about it, but um, it, so could this be run on places like floodplains? Um, and if so, um, you know, could we run it on the floodplain, but just don't count the mountainous areas? Uh, that sounds ill-advised. Yeah. Um, you know, the model does calculate deposition. So like if the floodplain has really, really low slope, some slope, but really, really low slope, then I think, I don't know, the model results might be reasonable representing like very, very little export. But I don't know. What do you think, Stacy? Is that just a totally not possible? Well, I wouldn't want to run the model and then completely remove all the mountains. Um, the caveat about these, and there's a, a post in the forum right now about this, in very, very flat areas, it's really hard to model water flow correctly. So you end up with some strange stream artifacts in the model. And that is, it would take a long time to really talk about this. I would actually recommend going to the forum and there's a, a lengthy discussion about this right now if that's something you're concerned about. Um, but floodplains can be a little bit of a problem. Perfect. Thank you both. We're gonna take a five minute break. So we'll meet back in five minutes to start exercises with SDR. And you'll know the break is up because the music will end.
Welcome back. We'd like to remind you that a recording of this webinar and the slides we present today will be available on our virtual workshop webpage following the event. And we also remind you to please use the question and answer or Q&A box for questions to Ginger and Stacy about workshop content and the chat only for issues with the webinar itself. When submitting a question, check that the same one is not already in the queue from another attendee. If it is, simply give it a thumbs up rather than resubmitting it. And also, if your question goes unanswered today, we will be following it up with an email to everyone with all the answers to anything that didn't get answered on air. So we thank you for your cooperation. And I'm gonna give it back to Ginger for the SDR exercise session. Okay, great. Thanks, Jesse. Okay, so this is the, the really new part of this workshop. Um, we've never done a interactive hands-on uh, session be online before, so this is pretty exciting. I'm going to be using data that came from the workshop data packet. So if you are able to um, download the workshop data packet, I'm going to be looking at only at things that are in that packet. So you should have access to all of these data. And if you can see my screen, you can see that I have open here the SDR worksheet. This is a PDF that was in the data packet. And I've also opened up the inputs for the SDR model in QGIS. So when you're dealing with invest models, um, you do not need a GIS to run the model. The, um, the SDR model and all of the invest models are standalone applications that you can run from your computer. You don't need any other software to run the model, but you really do need GIS software to prepare the inputs, process the outputs, and it's really helpful to just use GIS to look at the inputs and the outputs and kind of navigate around. Um, so, if you're going to be applying SDR or any invest model, you really need someone on your team who is handy with GIS and knows how to manipulate spatial data like rasters and vectors. So um, in the workshop data packet, we have the inputs to run SDR and we also have some example results. And those results came from me running the SDR model with those example inputs just so that you have an opportunity to look at example results from the model. But first, let's look through the inputs. So these are sample data to run the model that would be distributed with the model when you download Invest on your computer. And I'll go through and just um, take a look at each of these inputs and also tell you a little bit about where they came from. So first we have the DEM. That's what you're seeing this raster here. So all of these inputs are from the area of the upper Tana waterfront. So we're, we're in, uh, in Kenya, upstream from Nairobi, supplying water to Nairobi. And the DEM just shows us um, the topography in this area. So you can see that uh, the outlet of this little subwatershed is down here in the northeast. And the higher, more mountainous regions are up here in the West. This DEM was uh, downloaded from SRTM, the NASA Shuttle Radar Data Topography Mission. So this is globally available data. It's at three, uh, 30 meters resolution, but it was resampled to match the land cover. So as I mentioned during the overview, the DEM is the authoritative resolution for this model. If you give the model inputs of different resolution, everything will be resampled to match the DEM. So if you have a great land use data set, like this one is, that's at very fine resolution, and you want to make use of this fine resolution, you need to make sure that your DEM matches that. Okay, next, the next input is erosivity. So this is, um, it describes, you know, the erosive power of rainfall. And a very common way to get this erosivity index is from uh, annual 
average precipitation. And so the equations to convert annual average precipitation into this erosivity, which ranges, it's about in the three to four thousands range, are in the user guide. Check the user guide to calculate erosivity from annual rainfall. Next, we have erodibility. This is soil erodibility or how easily the soil will be eroded. You can see that this was, this is a raster, just like the other inputs. You can see the raster um, boundary here, but you can see that it was derived from a polygon layer. So this was derived from the SOTER database, S-O-T-E-R, which is another global database of soil. Um, and the, uh, the method, again, for calculating erodibility from soil variables that would be available in a database like the SOTER database are in the user guide. These uh, SOTER data are also freely available for download anywhere in the world. Okay, next is maybe the most important uh, input, the land use land cover raster. This is already really nicely symbolized by Stacy um, by type. So you can see that up here in the uh, higher portions of the watershed, it's forested. And then there's this kind of uh, T zone in the middle of the watershed and a coffee zone down at the base. Um, this would be linked to a biophysical table, which I forgot to open. Let's see. I'll open the biophysical table. And in this biophysical table, you can see that there's a row for each land cover type. So urban, grass, agroforestry. The values in this raster are integers um, and they match the values in this column LU code. This is the land use code. So the rest of the columns in this biophysical table are those coefficients that go with each land cover type. So the important ones for SDR are the USLE C, that C factor, and the P factor for USLE. So remember, USLE is just the product of erosivity, erodibility, um, slope, and these two biophysical coefficients. The higher they are, the more predicted erosion you'll have. So you can see really high C factors for roads, um, pretty high for agriculture, quite low for T, um, very low for forest. That means that the model expects low predicted erosion from forest relative to agriculture or roads, for example. These were derived um, from a literature search uh, for the area, for the Upper Tana Basin. So um, it's very common, if you don't have information about one of these, it's very common to set all land classes to be the same, especially the P factor. Um, if you don't have good information to inform, you know, C and P for both land class, just set all P to be one. That basically, you know, it's a uniform value across land cover types, and then take these C factors from, uh, from whatever literature you can find. So the last input, and then I'll, um, we'll pause for questions maybe, is the sub watersheds. So this, um, it's not required to run the model for um, subdivided watersheds. You do definitely need to run the model for um, one watershed, one hydrologically complete area. But um, it can sometimes be handy to divide that main watershed up into sub watersheds just to see um, how the different areas of the landscape are behaving because the model will aggregate all of the results up to these sub watersheds. And these were generated using that helper tool, delineate it, um, that's, that's uh, distributed with invest. So before we um, dive into the worksheet here, Stacy, do we have any questions or, or shall we move on? Um, there are a couple that I'll bring up now that have to do with the input data. 
Um, and it, I, and one of them has to do with the hydrologically correct um, asking, are there DEMs that you would recommend that are hydrologically correct outside of hydro sheds? And then what are the methods to correct a DEM? Great questions. These are very important. So uh, people, I'm sure, are getting the message that routing in the model is really important and all of the routing is done on the DEM. So if the DEM is not hydrologically correct, uh, you'll get streams that are choppy, you'll get pits where water just kind of disappears, and then your export results will be wrong, just totally wrong. So uh, where can you get DEMs? Um, I guess Maybe the most important answer to that question is what to do if your DEM is not hydrologically correct. Um, filling pits is usually the most important um, post-processing step. So that will kind of create a continuous flow surface or hopefully will create a continuous flow surface. Sometimes you have to kind of burn in the streams. Uh, I've only had to do that um, in one case, but uh, I think, does route dam perform pit filling, Stacey? It, it does. It does a simple form of pit filling. I think it's the same thing that you find in QGIS, the, the Wang and Lu tool that we normally recommend. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this tool that Stacey mentioned, route dam, um, is a really nice kind of DEM processing tool that you can use to, um, to fill pits, which, which means it'll smooth over your DEM um, and also check st the stream network. That's a really important thing um, when running the model with a DEM for the first time, just to check the stream network and make sure it looks continuous and nice and smooth. Yeah, the only other thing I'll say about that is the different DEMs are going to work better or worse in different places in the world. So I've had this person says something other than, you know, uh, hydro sheds. Hydro sheds works great in some places. I've had it work horribly in other places. So you may need to try several sources in order to get a stream network that makes sense to you. Um, a question about the um, biophysical table, and it's a quick one. When we prepare the land cover map, we have to set the value field to be the same as the LULC code in the biophysical data, right? Right. That is correct. That's very important. Yeah, that's a, that's a common error, I think. The model will crash very soon if it finds a discrepancy or there's a value in your land use raster that doesn't appear in your biophysical table. That's, you know, the model will, will definitely totally crash. Um, right, now I don't know how many questions we wanna take. We do have a few like how to calculate the P factor for a land cover class. Um, I would say on that one, it, it's you don't really calculate it, you look it up. So that both the C factor and the P factor, you usually do a literature search to find out, you know, what kind of maybe you find out that when people put in terracing, it reduces sediment by 80%. So you can use that information to create your P factor. Um, so it's really down to a literature search. Okay, great. Um, I know where we don't have a whole lot of time. So mm -hmm. let's let's just take a look at this worksheet. So this is the, the PDF that was in the workshop data packet for SDR. And this worksheet um, kind of takes you through running the model with the data that were supplied and exploring the outputs to um, kind of guide you through how the outputs of this model would typically be interpreted. So let's do that. You don't need to run the model, but you can look at the results that were distributed with the workshop data packet. And I've put those up here. These are the results that um, would correspond to a baseline run. So these were just run with the uh, inputs that we just looked at. And uh, they all have the um, appendix or the suffix example. You can see that all of these results contain that word, example. And that's the results suffix that I um, gave to the, to the model, just to show that these come from an example run. Um, so yeah, I asked you to open in the 
in the worksheet, I asked you to open the watershed results, the sediment retention uh, results, and the stream. So let's first just look at the stream. This is how you would check to make sure that the model is creating nice, continuous, realistic streams. So you can see um, these look good. They're quite wide here. This is a very wide stream. Um, must be quite a flat area right here. But in general, there's no breaks. Um, they, it looks like a reasonable stream network. This is what you would compare to your perennial uh, stream network, a real data source of streams, to make sure that the model is representing streams correctly. So uh, next, let's look at the watershed results. And then I think it's time for our first poll question. Lori, can you throw up SDR Q1? Um, awesome, thanks. So we're gonna look at the attribute table for these watershed results. And we're gonna look at the um, sediment retention for each of these watersheds. You can see that I've actually symbolized these watersheds by their sediment retention value. And so the question is, which subwatershed has the highest sediment retention? I'm going to also sort the attribute table by sediment retention. And okay, I'm ready for folks to give their answers. Um, so Okay, weigh in on the poll, please, and let us know if you can tell which subwatershed has the highest sediment retention. Okay. Lori, can you go ahead and close the poll? Oh my God, you guys are amazing. Yes. So, sediment, uh, watershed, subwatershed one has the highest sediment retention. It's this one up here. Okay, so let's move on. I know we're really close to needing to move on to um, NDR, but let's look at this next question. So within subwatershed one, which areas contribute the most to sediment retention? So here's where we need to look at the pixel-based example. So this is the same value that went into calculating those watershed results, but simply at the pixel level. So if we're looking at this upper area in um, subwatershed one, I've also symbolized this by um, sediment retention. So looking at this and looking at the streams, which you can see are also reflected in our sediment retention raster, uh, it's not a trick question which areas appear to be contributing more to sediment retention. Give you a couple seconds to weigh in on the poll. Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll. Yeah, okay, so most of you said areas close to the stream are contributing more. That's what I thought too. You can really see the topography reflected in these sediment retention results where these kind of ridges high up have very little sediment retention. That makes sense because there's not much water or sediment flowing over those places. It's those places next to the stream that kind of have the chance to retain sediment. I think it's time to move on to NDR. We will have another opportunity to look at data, um, very similar data for this area, for the same area for NDR. So um, I'm sorry, there was a very quick hands-on portion, but I'm gonna get ready to talk now about NDR. Thank you, Ginger. Awesome. Uh, oops. 
Apologies, getting there. All right. Um, all right. Okay. So, um, luckily, the NDR model is very closely related to SDR. So, if you have any lingering questions about SDR, um, those will probably still be relevant here. As you can tell from the name of the model, nutrient delivery ratio, um, it's basically derived from the theory that, um, that informed the sediment delivery ratio model. So let's talk about how this model works and, and then we'll have time for more questions and answer. So similar to um, the sediment model, this model is concerned with nutrient loads in, in, the, in the streams, in the water. So under the supply service value framework, we're looking at the biophysical supply of nutrient retention by vegetation, or the, um, the, the service is water purification or keeping nutrient out of the streams. And, um, by retaining nutrients on the landscape and keeping those, lands those nutrients out of streams, this can provide the value of avoided treatment cost downstream, similar to sediment loads in the stream. We're just looking at um, nutrient loads on the landscape and where those are being delivered to the stream. So the model works very similarly to SDR. Um, the biggest difference between this model and the sediment model is that the sources of nutrients, instead of being predicted by USLE, are simply defined by land use. But again, we're concerned with um, nitrogen or phosphorus um, coming off of each pixel, and then how much of that nitrogen and or phosphorus is exported or delivered to the stream. So the model can help us to quantify the ability of the landscape to retain nutrient and keep it out of streams. So as I said, the main difference, um, the main new thing about this model is that in the nutrient model, nutrient loads are a function of land cover. So forest, for example, would have one nitrogen or phosphorus application rate. General agriculture would have a different application rate etc. And these are usually derived from nutrient application rates like fertilizer use, livestock density, or even just atmospheric deposition. And then we use a very similar concept to the sediment delivery ratio to calculate the upslope contributing area and the downslope retention path, estimating the fraction of that nutrient applied that is exported to the stream. So NDR is calculated just like SDR, the delivery ratio for sediment. Um, while SDR for a given pixel is calculated relative to a calibration parameter, the maximum FDR, NDR for a given pixel is calculated relative to the maximum retention efficiency of the downslope path between that pixel and the stream. And then again, nutrient exported by a given pixel uh, to the stream is the product of the load of nutrient on that pixel and the delivery ratio. Total nutrient export in a watershed is just the sum of that value over pixels. Uh, in addition to nutrients reaching the stream by surface runoff, which is that part that is calculated very similarly to SDR, the model can also represent subsurface flow. This represents the flow of dissolved nitrogen transported by groundwater. And this doesn't apply to phosphorus um, simply because phosphorus is usually sediment bound. And so surface transport is the dominant mode of transport for phosphorus. The expression for subsurface NDR for nitrogen, instead of being related to retention, um, is a simple exponential decay with the distance to the stream. And this plateaus at the value corresponding to a user-defined maximum subsurface nutrient retention. This is highly simplified um, relative to the model of 
surface flow and surface export. So the inputs, uh, again, are quite similar to the last model that we looked at. We do need a precipitation or a quick flow index. So this is a climate related input. Um, and this, this is because the model modifies nutrient road, nutrient load by runoff potential. And this can either come from um, precipitation in the study area or a quick flow index like you would get from another model. We also need, again, the DEM, digital elevation model, and this threshold flow accumulation, same idea there. We need the land use land cover raster, and in this case, the biophysical table that corresponds to that land use land cover raster would contain the nutrient loads themselves, and then also the efficiency of retention and the critical retention length. I'll talk a little bit more about those next. Again, you must run this model for a watershed or a hydrologically complete area because routing is used to determine export of the nutrient. And any uh, subsurface flow is optional for nitrogen. Let's take a closer look at the biophysical table for this model. It looks very similar to the table that we already looked at for SDR where there's a row for each land use class. For example, values, um, coefficients for urban paved roads, coefficients for grass, et cetera. Um, the new parameters here are these load, um, retention efficiency, and the critical length. These describe um, the load of phosphorus applied, kilograms per hectare per year, the maximum retention efficiency for phosphorus of that land, land cover type, and the critical length or the distance that it takes for this land cover type to retain phosphorus at its maximum retention efficiency. Let's illustrate those values and how they work together to calculate retention. So, for example, for a given land cover type, let's say for grass, um, if the effective uh, efficiency value is 0 0.5 or 50% and the critical length is 30 meters, then that means that phosphorus must flow across the landscape through 30 meters total of grassland before that 50% retention is achieved. So that's where those uh, biophysical table coefficients come into play. The outputs from the NDR model are both on the pixel and the subwatershed basis. So you'll get a raster of nutrient export per pixel, like you see in the upper right hand corner here. That shows annual average nutrient export reaching the stream from that pixel. This shows you which parts of the landscape are contributing to nutrient loads in the stream and which are, which are not contributing very much nutrient. You'll also get um, results aggregated up to subwatersheds similar to SDR. So the SDR model actually calculates sediment retention for you. The NDR model, you need to calculate nutrient retention if you're if that's what you're interested in uh, post hoc from the model results so there's two ways we recommend you could do this on a watershed you could um, simply divide the nutrient export by the nutrient load those will be given in the attribute table of the results from the model and we'll take a look at this during the exercise. This gives you the proportion of the nutrient applied in that watershed that is exported to the stream. So if it's really high, that means that your retention is low or most of the nutrient that's applied inside the watershed is also making it to the stream. The second way you can um, quantify nutrient retention is on a pixel basis to take the difference in export between the current landscape and uh, degraded sort of reference scenario landscape. So you would run NDR on your current landscape and then run NDR on a reference landscape 
For example, maybe a landscape where you've um, replaced all land cover types with bare ground and calculate the change between them. That gives you an idea of the places where vegetation is really contributing to nutrient retention. Some of the important limitations of this model, um, it's like all invest models, highly simplified. That's by design. We want it to be easy to apply this model, but it means that we have to really simplify the way it represents some processes, especially those subsurface um, transport of nutrients. It's a simple exponential decay with distance. So uh, keep that in mind if subsurface flow is very important in your area. Like SDR, this model does not represent any in-stream processes. And again, once nutrients reach the stream, they're considered by the model to be exported. So this doesn't consider um, change or deposition of nutrient after it's reached the stream. Also, this is also an annual average model. It will give you an idea of in an average year where most nutrient is being um, transported to the stream from the landscape. It's not appropriate for event-based nutrient pollution um, or point-based nutrient pollution for that matter. It's really, it reflects um, the contribution of different land cover types because the load is a function of land cover. This is often applied, this model um, is often applied to look at changes in land cover from forest to agriculture, for example, or from forest to urban, where you would have a really strong land cover signal and where nutrients are being, um, are coming from on your landscape. And also, again, um, calibration of the model to empirical data is really uh, important if you want to use the absolute value of the results from this model. If you don't have calibration data available, that's okay, but that means you should really just pay attention to relative differences across space. This subwatershed has high nutrient export. This subwatershed has low nutrient export. Uh, you can't really um, put stock in the numbers, the absolute values of those areas until you've calibrated the model. So um, in conclusion, before we get to some question and answer time, uh, this model, the nutrient re delivery ratio model, is all about delivery of nutrient from land cover to streams. It can be useful to identify low export areas or high retention areas that should be targets for conservation. It's a simplified average annual model, and it's really designed to estimate the impact of management interventions, specifically land cover change on stream nutrient loads. So with that, um, let's take some questions. Okay, um, one very common question that's actually pretty tough is how the retention efficiency can be calculated. How, like how much? How to create the input for the model for the different uh, land cover types for retention efficiency. I'm just going to hand that one right back to you, Stacy. Yeah, I know. It's well, that's another hard one. It's another literature search. Pretty much everything in the biophysical table, um, in any of the biophysical tables, is usually gotten through a big literature search. Um, retention efficiency, sometimes you can get from uh, studies that have looked at riparian corridors and how planting different kinds of vegetation along riparian corridors can impact um, nutrients or sediments. So that's one, that, that's probably the most common um, type of literature you'd find that information. Um, so another one is the biophysical table, this is a general question, seems to be very critical for driving SCR and NDR. Any key points to remember when preparing our tables? Okay, I'll just say a couple things. Um, the, the user, the participant is correct. It's highly critical. So, you know, what the models are really good at is making these spatial relationships. They're the 
that's kind of like the innovative thing that the model can do for you that you couldn't do um, on your own in a spreadsheet or something. The model will route things and um, can help you see what's the impact of if we had more um, urban area or more agriculture, or what's the impact if we moved the agriculture over here far from the stream versus close to the stream. But yeah, the model cannot tell you the retention efficiency of agriculture versus grass. That's simply up to you to come up with those inputs. So like Stacy said, that was a great answer that um, it usually comes from looking up those values in the literature. Um, I will just add that the biophysical table is a great place to devote some time to a sensitivity analysis. Um, so if you have time to do um, calibration, you should. If you have empirical data to calibrate the model, you should. And also if you have time to explore the sensitivity of the model to your inputs. Um, I mentioned a couple calibration parameters for SDR, but um, aside from those parameters, uh, the biophysical table is a great place to move values up and down and just see how much the results change. And so even if you have a lot of uncertainty in those values, which unfortunately you probably will, we almost always do have high uncertainty in those values, uh, a sensitivity analysis will give you an idea of whether that uncertainty is driving huge variation in your model results or whether it's relatively minor. Anything else to add, Stacey? Um, no, no, that seemed pretty complete to me. Um, the next question has to do with nutrient sources. Um, what are the nutrient sources? A little more clarification on that and how to get them. So what, and what kind of information do you put for native vegetation? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so I'm actually working on a really neat project with some partners at NACAP right now, uh, global modeling of changes in, um, in land use and population um, and their impacts on nutrients. So um, Stacy, maybe I'll throw the, the um, native or natural vegetation one over to you, but I will say that um, a really important that we're input that we're working on in this global study and land use change is changes in the extent of agriculture where nutrient is literally applied as fertilizer. There are great coarse but great uh, global data sets out there about fertilizer use at different points of time in different countries um, disaggregated from the country level down to pixels. Um, so that's something that we've been learning a lot about and there are there are great data sources out there for saying what is fertilizer application in this place, um, in this country at this time. Another really good one is livestock. So, you know, anytime you have a large congregation of livestock, that's a lot of nitrogen um, being applied basically in manure. And there are also great global data about um, the distribution of livestock, how many livestock um, where, um, which is a important nutrient source. So, um, yeah, maybe mm, that work yeah. is, yeah, I, I'm just wondering if we could share those links with people, but um, we'll, I'll try to do that after uh, in the follow-up email. But Stacy, do you have any other good pointers about uh, native vegetation, especially? Um, for native vegetation, um, there, again, you can find some studies that have quantified that. Um, it's going to be a much lower value, but the, the thing is that natural vegetation does use as well as produce because of the breakdown of things in the forests and everywhere. Um, so it does actually produce a little bit of nitrogen and phosphorus, and those are the two main things being um, modeled here. So um, you, they will probably be very low values. Um, but again, they're values that you're going to get from a literature search. I hate to keep saying that, but every time we do a model, we go and do a literature search to try to find places that are similar. It's a bit of yeah, a broken record. That's definitely it. And um, I don't think it's just me. I think it's true that um, lately in the last, I don't know, five or 10 years, there there have been more and more global data sets, um, sort of like nice synthetic global data sets, whether they're modeled, like they might be the results of another model, a nutrient model for the globe, mm -hmm. um, or maybe uh, sort of a synthetic spatial, 
you know, analysis of statistics disaggregated. That's what these agriculture and livestock data sets are. But um, there's a lot of great um, global data sets out there. It often takes some finesse, both on the data management side and on the science side to interpret those data sets, make sure that they're in the right units, um, make sure that they correspond to an average annual time period, that kind of thing to mesh, you know, to match up what the data set that's available with the needs of the model. Um, but yeah, there, there are good sources out there. Um, I've had a couple of questions about marine water quality, so I thought I'd just make a note about this. This model is really for terrestrial water quality. It is not made to handle coastal situations. Um, I, I know we were working on a coastal nutrient model at one time, but that didn't happen for some reason. So um, I would not use this model in that context. You could use the model to quantify how much nutrient is being produced on land that arrives in a river. And then you could use a separate model to say, okay, what happens with that nutrient once it hits the ocean or once it hits our mangroves? Um, so that would be a separate process that our models don't, don't handle right now. Okay, so if we have time for another one, um, uh, and this is common. So somebody has two main sources of pollutants in their watershed, um, including a region where most of the pollutants come from point sources. So sewerage system and surface mining areas. Um, could the NDR model be used in that context? So my answer would be probably not. Um, that, yeah, that's, I think that's just not that kind of nutrient um, source that this model's designed to really capture. What do you think, Stacy? Is there a way to get around that or? Not particularly. Well, it also depends where the nutrient's being discharged. If it's being discharged directly into a stream, then no, the model won't pick it up. If it's ending up in the groundwater, then it's may not, it probably won't be picked up very well um, by the model. You can potentially turn that point source into one raster pixel of a particular land cover type that has a certain loading value. So there, you could possibly fit those kind of point sources into the model, um, but you'd have to really think about you know, whether it's appropriate, like discharge right into the stream, no, that won't work. Um, and because really the model's made for non-point source conditions. Yeah, that, that's a good point though, that sometimes, you know, um, you can kind of get creative with, with uh, the representation of land use in your land use raster. So the all of the inputs that we've provided today are very kind of traditional land use, like you've got forest versus grassland versus urban versus roads. That's very, um, that's a good place to start. But if you know um, more about your landscape to say, well, this forest over here is managed in a different way where it has higher nutrient export or higher nutrient loads, then you can do that GIS processing to turn that into a unique land cover type and represent that area as a different source of nutrients. So, um, good point. Yeah, the only other thing I'll say about that is if you were to model a place, you were to do the model in NDR to look at the surface um, nutrients, and then you do know that you have significant point sources in the watershed, you would want to take those into consideration if you're doing a calibration exercise. Um, so even if you're not modeling them, you need to kind of subtract out your point sources from your observed data in order to compare for calibration. So that's a little bit of a tangent, but it's really important if you are taking that step. Cool. So thank you both, Ginger and Stacy. We're, we're slightly ahead of schedule. So let's take another five minute break and we'll devote the extra time to the NDR exercise session. Okay, Excellent. so awesome. So we're slightly ahead of the schedule shown here. We're gonna come back in five minutes, which is about at the half hour.
or you can just wait to hear the song end. <laughs> Thank you.
okay, great. Welcome back. Hopefully that was long enough of a break for everyone. I'm gonna pass it back to Ginger to do the NDR exercise session. Great. Thanks, Jesse. All right, we have a little bit longer for this exercise. So I hope we'll be able to um, get through more poll questions because it's really nice to hear from you guys. Listen to the void. Um, so I, I just want to point out this worksheet specifically is much longer than we will have time to get to today. So please, now that you have all of the inputs to run the model in the workshop data packet, hopefully you were able to install the invest model suite as well. Please use this worksheet if it's helpful to um, walk you through the, uh, the, uh, the outputs of the model. And there's some examples in here and how to um, quantify the change in nutrient retention with a land management scenario. You have the inputs to do that. There's some suggestions here about how to do calibration of NDR, and there's even a suggestion here about a very basic sensitivity analysis. So all of that guidance is here in the worksheet. We won't have time to get through all of it together, but um, hopefully that can be a useful aid for you after the workshop. So looking at the data for NDR, um, once again, I've opened this up in QGIS and I'm looking at the inputs that we use to run the model. I'll just quickly tell you where these inputs came from. Most of them are the same as what we used for SDR. So we have the DEM, which is used by the model to route and create streams. Um, we have the same land use raster. Uh, this, I guess I didn't tell you exactly where this came from. Um, this is a a very nice product developed by the Nature Conservancy for the Upper Tana Water Fund business case. Um, the Nature Conservancy made a detailed update of the AfriCover land use maps using satellite imagery and maps from stakeholders and ground truth points. So this is a, I mentioned a very fine resolution, 15 meter resolution, which is finer than what I've usually used in Invest. Um, and it was it custom developed by the Nature Conservancy for this application. If you didn't have, you know, this land cover map or the funding to do a um, develop a data source like that, then what you would probably use in this area is AfriCover. That's the global, well, it's the global equivalent for Africa. So it's a um, land use map for Africa. Uh, the next input that we'll look at is precipitation. So this is used by the model as a quick flow index. You might see that this looks very similar to the erosivity that we used for SDR. That's because erosivity was just um, multiplied by, it, derived from precipitation by multiplying by a constant. So that's our average annual precipitation for this area. And last, there are sub watersheds. So these are the same as what we used for SDR. It helps us kind of divvy up the landscape into these different uh, hydrologic regions to see how they differ from each other. Okay, the last input to look at is the biophysical table. This goes with the land use raster, just like SDR. I'm gonna cover up these, these fields. The fields that, um, that we look at for this model, the really critical fields are the load of phosphorus. In this example, we're just running the model for phosphorus. You could run it for um, nitrogen or nitrogen and phosphorus. Here we're looking at the load of phosphorus on each land cover class. I believe this is in kilograms per hectares per year, but I would have to check the user's guide to be sure about that. You can see, let's see, the highest load is I think in coffee. Uh, interesting. Agroforestry has a relatively high load um, and let's see, water has no load. Makes sense. Um, urban areas have a very uh, pretty high load. Okay, the next value is the efficiency. So this is um, the maximum fraction of phosphorus that can be retained by this land cover class. So we have 
high retention in forest makes sense high retention in grass uh, very low retention on roads that makes sense very little vegetation okay and the critical length so this is the length in meters that phosphorus has to travel through in this land cover class in order to achieve that maximum retention efficiency um, it looks to me like it's 15 for many of these uh, interesting that that is the same as the resolution of the DEM. Probably not a coincidence. Uh, in fact, many of these, yep, grass is a multiple of the resolution of the DD, DEM. Um, anyway, I'm guessing that most of these values came from a search of the literature. It did but indeed hopefully come from a you. search of the literature. Um, a lot of these are actually global values. Um, there is actually a database that you can get off of our website where we've collected some sources of data and given sort of places where that data was collected, the papers that it's from, and where in the world it's related to. Um, and so most of these came from those sources. Cool. Thanks, Stacy. Okay, so that gives you an idea of uh, what the inputs look like for this model. Um, Next, let's look at um, this task one, nutrient export for the baseline scenario. So in the worksheet, we're gonna look at the um, example results that I supplied in the workshop data packet. These all have, again, that suffix example. These came from running the NDR model with those inputs. And in the worksheet, we're asked to open up the watershed results, which is that vector. Um, of our sub watersheds and P export examples. So this is the raster of phosphorus export on the pixel level. And then um, the worksheet also asks us to open up the land cover. And okay, first question here, which sub watershed has the highest nutrient export? So this is similar, thank you, Lori. Um, we're gonna look here at the aggregated watershed results and we would look at the attribute table. And we're going to look at, let's see, we're looking at nutrient exports. So we're gonna look at this field, P export. And okay, so you guys weigh in, which sub watershed has the highest total nutrient export? I'll give you a couple seconds. Okay, you guys did so well on the first one. I think I underestimated the abilities of our audience. So let's go ahead and close the poll. Yeah, you guys, you guys have got it. Watershed ID five. And I've also symbolized these already by uh, nutrient export. So you can see that um, watershed ID five is this one down on the bottom. Yeah. Okay, so next question. Um, within subwatershed five, which areas appear to contribute the most to nutrient exports? So for that, we're going to need to look at the pixel based results. And let me turn that off. So we're looking at this southern area here. Um, so each pixel value here is the phosphorus export from that pixel or the phosphorus applied to that pixel that is actually exported to the stream. And then it can be helpful to kind of toggle back and forth with the land use. Because we're asking, is grass, agroforestry, coffee, or tea contributing? So I'll just tell you, I'm looking specifically at these areas down here where we have some pretty dark green, some pretty high export. And go ahead and weigh in on the poll. Can you tell? What kind of land use are those areas? Give you a couple seconds. Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll. Yeah, so um, most people said coffee. That's what I would have said too. Um, it looks to me like these dark brown areas 
are kind of associated with all of a sudden higher nutrient export. Of course, you know, maybe the most um, precise way to manage to uh, answer that question would be to um, divide up your watershed results, uh, I'm sorry, your export results here by different land uses and summarize kind of like zonal statistics within these land uses. But I just wanted to give you an idea of interpreting phosphorus export on the pixel scale. Okay, we have time to get into our second question here. So um, remember, there are a couple different ways to quantify nutrient retention. The model does not do that for you, unlike SDR. Um, awesome. Let's um, go ahead and follow these instructions for quantifying nutrient retention. We're going to use the um, percent exported. So, okay, this is this is a little nerve wracking to do on the fly, but I'm going to create a field called PRET. It's a float field. And we're going to calculate PRET. So this is retention. So for each watershed, retention, I'm going to calculate it as export divided by load. And I apologize, the, you know, it's a limitation of the shapefile data format that these column names are a little unwieldy, but um, so we're looking at, we're taking the export column and divide that by the load, which is surface load. This other load is subsurface P load, but we didn't include subsurface flow. So update that and we get basically a fraction of nutrient retained. Um, actually, it would be the fraction exported. Oh no, that means that this poll question is going to be backwards. Um, shoot. So we're looking here at um, the fraction of export. So a high value here would actually be like most of the most of the phosphorus applied in the watershed is reaching the surface, is reaching the stream. So that means that we're gonna look at the lowest value for this retention, this new field. I'm sorry, that is kind of like a trick question, but let's go ahead and weigh in on the poll. So which subwatershed has the lowest fraction exported? Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll. Yeah, this is a tricky question and I apologize for that. That's because of the way that we calculated that and the way that the question is phrased. So just in case you, please correct me if I'm wrong. But since we're looking at the fraction of exported phosphorus um, from that that was applied, we would be looking for a low value here meaning that um, subwatershed two actually has the, the lowest amount exported, meaning the highest ret retention. So subwatershed three has the highest value for this field, but that means that subwatershed three has a very high um, fraction of the applied phosphorus reaching the stream. Given that, um, that means that our next question is also a little tricky, um, but let's see. Assuming, let's see, assuming that subwatershed three has low, um, low export or high retention, what does that tell you about this study landscape? Does that tell you that there just isn't very much phosphorus applied in subwatershed free, that it's um, mostly retained by the vegetation. So again, I apologize for this confusing question, but let's assume that subwatershed three has high retention, low export. I'll give you a few seconds to think that through.
Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll. All right, this one was close. But it looks like most people said that a relatively large fraction of the phosphorus applied in that subwatershed is retained before making it to the stream. That's the correct answer. So the other, um, the other answer that some people chose, let's keep this open for a second. Um, this idea that the phosphorus applied in the upper subwatersheds is retained by vegetation in the lower subwatersheds, that might be intuitively, um, that might make sense intuitively, but that's not what this result um, tells us because we calculated this just on the level of subwatersheds. So we're looking at export within this watershed relative to load within this watershed. Um, therefore, we're only looking at the phosphorus that was applied inside that subwatershed and how much of that phosphorus makes it to the stream. Okay, let's break for questions in just one second. Um, I just want to mention the next, I don't think we have time to actually go through this next activity, this next suggestion in the worksheet, but here's what you would do. We would open the NDR model and run the model with the same inputs that were used to derive those baseline layers, except you would supply a new land use land cover map. And this is inside your workshop data packet. Looks like I'm populated with the baseline, but if I wanted to run this management scenario, I would give it a different suffix, and I would pick a different land use land cover raster here and a different biophysical table here. And you have those inside your workshop data packet. This tells you where to find them. And then you would simply look at the results, compare those to these baseline results, and you could look at things like whether nutrient export changed on the subwatershed uh, level. Um, and you could also look at you know, differences on the pixel level versus on the subwatershed level. We've just got a few minutes before it's time to wrap up. So Stacy, are there any um, questions about this exercise? Um, not about the exercise, but a couple of general questions that we could take. Um, one of them, again, is about the biophysical table, which is always the hard part. Um, the question is, um, for example, if the biophysical table was prepared for a small area, like if you had field survey data, um, and you're running the model on a larger area, the whole watershed, can we still use this model? So the idea of taking biophysical parameters from one um, type of, of study and using it elsewhere. Uh, yeah, my, I, I think that's a, I, I think that's a pretty sound method in a lot of cases. It's all about whether that small area is representative of the larger area. So um, you would want to think about, you know, the land cover categories are, um, is there similar types of land cover in the larger area as there are in the small area? And do they behave similarly in terms of their nutrient loads and their potential nutrient retention? What do you think, Stacy? Yeah, and if you have field survey data from your local area, you are so lucky because a lot of the rest of us are taking values from the other side of the world and using it in our side of the world. So, um, you know, just think critically about whether that value represents your that same land cover type well, like Ginger said, and um, yes, you can definitely use it that way. Um, the second general question is about um, visualization. We had a little visual, visualization um, talk in our first workshop, and any suggestions how, how to best visualize the final maps for publication? And I guess I'll say one thing on that. There's a lot that could be said about that, but the main thing is it depends on your audience. Um, so maps might be good for some people, a table or a single number might be better for other people. Um, you know, there's a lot of variables that go into visualizing things very clearly and communicating them in a way that your audience needs. Um, so I don't think there's a, a best way to visualize it as long as you are, whatever you are giving is accurate. Um, 
and you're making sure any limitations are known. Um, but otherwise, it's going to be very dependent on your audience. What do you think, Ginger? Yeah, and I would just say we do have a sort of a visualization expert at NatCap. Charlotte um, gave a great presentation in our first workshop. So if you haven't seen the the first workshop, you know, Stacy talked about some coastal services, and Charlotte talked about visualization. So that's a great question. I, you know, not my forte. I'm all about the data, not about the pictures. So. Mm -hmm. um, it would encourage folks to check out Charlotte's portion. It was the last presentation in the first workshop. Yeah, yeah, it's very helpful. Okay, so aside from a validation that yes, it's tough to get the data, um, I think this is a good place to stop with questions. Great. I'll just point out these, uh, the last parts of the exercise, which again, we're not going to do together. Um, but there, so this exercise gives task four is to actually do a rough calibration of the model. And, um, you know, assuming, let's say that you had some empirical data given uh, the real export rate um, at the outlet of, of one of these subwatersheds in kilograms of phosphorus per hectare per year, you would use the K parameter, and I'll just show where that is. Um, this this k parameter is is given in the here in the in the model as a good place to start for um for calibration here's the little info tab it says it is the borselli k parameter you would tweak that up and down um and then look at look at the changes in your model uh and then the last task here can I can I make a can oh, I insert please. here for this? Um, we have had one or two questions about calibration, um, and one thing I will advise people is if you look in the user's guide, I believe they're in there. I know they're in the MOOC. Um, we have references to a couple of papers that our hydrologists did: one on the SCR model, one on the NDR model, that includes calibration and validation, where they talk about that process. So I highly recommend it. They are by both by Perrine Hamill um, and they're if, uh, in the Cape Fear catchment. Um, we can try to send links out to those papers um, in our follow-up email. But you can also find them in the user's guide. Yeah, great, great point that, um, yeah, most of the invest models have, you know, some peer reviewed papers written by the model developer that gives kind of like a, best case example of how you would apply that model, including calibration and validation. So that's a really great place to find best case um, practices for running the model. Um, so we mentioned sensitivity analysis. That's the last task here. Um, in, the, in the presentation, some people talked about, wow, there's so much uncertainty in the biophysical table. It's true. Um, that's just that's a reality of, of these types of models. So um, we've suggested here some, um, some very basic sensitivity analysis where you would change the value in the biophysical table, um, assessing the impact of um, changing the load for a given land use class and maybe even changing the effective length, or sorry, the efficiency. Um, for that land use class. And then you would look at changes in total um, phosphorus export and see, you know, how sensitive is phosphorus export to changes in those values for that land use class. Okay, time for me to say goodbye. Um, I really hope that you guys got something out of that. And yeah, I know Jesse will give a plug for the post course survey, but let me also say we will really take your responses to heart. Um, so thanks so much for tuning in and for your participation. Hope you enjoyed the music. Wow, thank you so much, Ginger and Stacy. You've presented so much great information today and I hope that everyone learned as much as I did. We ask our audience to please stick around to take our post event survey, which will launch shortly. Your feedback is extremely valuable and will help us to improve future workshop workshops by customizing them to your needs. Ginger did a good job of plugging these resources, but you should be aware of and rely upon these important resources for invest documentation and support. The user guide is an invaluable research resource for learning not only about the science 
and theory behind each model, but also how to use them. You can access it through our website where we have versions in English, Spanish, and Chinese. So be sure to read the user guide carefully before using a model and then use it as your first resource for answering questions. If you have questions about invest or problems that the user guide does not help with, another great resource is the NatCap forum. So you can find it at community.naturalcapitalproject.org. It's a natural capital community and support site monitored regularly by our engineers, data analysts, and scientists. There you can search for information, post new questions, and connect with ecosystem service practitioners around the world. Of course, if you haven't already, take NatCap's massive open online course or MOOC. It's available at edx.org, edx.org, and it is free. The course introduces NatCap's approach to using ecosystem service information to inform decisions. It uses specific examples to illustrate how the approach has worked in each case and highlights key methods and tools used in implementation. If you are not able to attend our first virtual workshop, Intro to Invest, or if you just need a review, please go to our website where you'll be able to view the full recording and access the complete slide deck. That's also the same site where we'll post the slides and recording of today's event later this week. Please enroll in our next Invest virtual workshop, Urban Invest, Modeling Ecosystem Services in Cities. That will be on August 18th and will be led by Chris and Roy from NatCap's Cities team. Visit our website, naturalcapitalproject.stanford.edu. There you'll be able to sign up for our newsletter, find our publications, and explore where we work. And visit NatCap's Data Viz site at viz.naturalcapitalproject.org. That's V-I-Z, that naturalcapitalproject.org. There you can navigate through examples of interactive viewers and dashboards and find resources to facilitate synthesizing, visualizing, and communicating data. It's super cool, so please check that out. Also, follow us on social media. Our Twitter handle is at natcapproject. And always feel free to email us anytime at investsummer2020 at gmail.com. We truly value your feedback. So please stick around for the post-event survey, which we will launch now. Take care and please join us again on August 18th for the Urban Invest Workshop.